celebrating and promoting social entrepreneurship. And we're very lucky here to be uh, uh, joined by a panel of distinguished practitioners of corporate social responsibility and social entrepreneurship. I'm, I'm remiss in not introducing myself to start things. My name is Bar Daydash, uh, and I work at the Asian Development Bank at our Manila headquarters in the field of social, social development and poverty reduction. And ADB is one of the sponsors uh, of these two days of activities, along with Tomasic University, the Global Social Venture Competition, uh, as well as IIX Asia. And uh, it's this partnership that has uh, produced what I think is going to be just a very uh, exciting uh, couple of days. We've, uh, many of you were here earlier today during the, the competition, the student, comp not student competition, but the uh, social venture competition. And a little bit later this evening, we'll find out uh, who the uh, successful competitors were. But uh, without further ado, let me introduce the panel uh, for which we're now assembled. And we're very lucky to have as our moderator, Jareen Shanaz. Doreen is the adjunct associate professor at Lee Kuan Yew, University, uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore, and also, and perhaps more significantly for this occasion, she's also the founder and the chair of Impact Investment Exchange and Impact uh, Investment Shujo, and she can tell you about those, uh, if not at the outset, then uh, during the Q&A period. So, uh, again, welcome, and for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, uh, the, the panelists will offer some remarks and observations on the context for social entrepreneurship, social enterprises, and there will be an opportunity for exchanges with the audience if we intend for this to be participatory. So if you have questions or your own comments, uh, please uh, feel free to contribute later in the program. Thank you and welcome.
extremely, extremely important. Um, so my panelists here today, um, we have uh, three panelists, and I actually I'm not going to talk too much about Impact Investment Exchange and Impact Investment Shujo, uh, because we'll have a half a day of that tomorrow. So I think uh, I will leave it to my colleagues to tell you more about what we're doing. But I'll just give you a teaser that we're actually creating a social stock exchange, which is very exciting. And then from Shujo's side, we're doing a lot of capacity building and research. So we'll hear all about it tomorrow. But I will actually spend more time talking about the amazing work that uh, my panelists are doing. So I will uh, you know, start off from my far left here, which is uh, we have here Sunit uh, Shrestha. Sunit is uh, the founder of Change Fusion. And uh, if you're at all familiar with the landscape of Thailand, of social enterprises, then you must have heard of Sunit because uh, Change Fusion is doing amazing work in uh, getting this sector off the ground here. And also he himself is playing a leadership role and, uh, and much of it also uh, in, in, a, in a way of being part of also now the committee that has been formed in the Prime Minister's office you know, for social enterprises. So uh, welcome to me. Then we have uh, Mr. Sukic Udindu. Um, Sukic is uh, with uh, the minor group. He's the, the vice president for corporate social responsibility there. But also, he actually is with the CSR club at the Thai Stock Exchange. So he plays two hats. So we're going to hear his opinion and his uh, insight from two different entities. And then we have Lin Menhuin, who is uh, Lin is with uh, Diageo, and uh, as the corporate social responsibility director. And he's going to talk about the work that uh, Diageo is doing across Asia in promoting the sector. And not only that, but also a lot of uh, public policy work. So here's my panel, and what I'm going to request my panel is each one of them um, talk a little bit about the work that they're doing, and then uh, we'll open it up with some questions, and it'll be very informal, so we can have a discussion. And uh, then the last few minutes, uh, I will keep you in suspense, but we'll do a little something quite interesting. So I will, I will leave it for that, so all of you stay. But uh, the key thing here is after the panel today, we actually will have the award ceremony, which I believe uh, um, it's going to be the other room, and then we have a reception. So please, please do stay on. A lot of good food and drinks, okay? And some drinks, so, so do stay on. Um, so, Sunit, do you want to tell us a little bit about your work? Sure. Okay, hi. Um, I'm Sunit. Um, I'm from Change Fusion. We are like a social innovation, um, design, and investment uh, organization. Basically, we work on kind of projects or innovation projects that bring in new technologies, new thoughts, so new partnership in, in solving certain problems. It can be anything from like uh, you know like disease problem, like disease surveillance problem. Like we are partnering with Google.org and few social enterprise uh, in Thailand in partnership with the Ministry of Public Health to come up with like a mobile based uh, real time disease surveillance system for, for the ministry. Um, that's all the way to a little bit of policy work, like working with the government to launch this uh, social enterprise commission and I mean committee and the master plan. Um, but uh, and we also try our best to support young social entrepreneurs or early stage social enterprise. So we we have a little bit of small seeding fund um, for some of them, and we help them reach uh, kind of private placement. I mean, at a very small level uh, for them as well. Thailand a little bit in the region. That's not what we. Okay, so <laughs> um, social enterprise and trust. So I, I was uh, told to actually give you a very quick picture on how social enterprise uh, scene is going in Thailand. Um, so in Thailand, um, we there's a lot of debates, and I think uh, within and this is basically what the government uh, definition came out to be. It's actually very similar to the UK. U.S. Uh, version, so it's uh, defined as a social enterprise is a social is a, that they have to have social environmental purpose with a kind of solutions to to their problems built in as their core business. And number two, they have to be financially sustainable um, and hopefully kind of into growth, but not necessary. Um, and then the third one is like uh, it's really important that they are not 
trying to maximize profit. I mean, they can have revenues and everything, but uh, most of their profits go back to the reinvest in the ventures or growth or reinvest into the community. So it's very broad within this broad definition, and there are very different types uh, that I can tell you afterwards. Okay. Um, so a bit of sizing. This is actually from the, the master plan that the government did the research on. And so these are like the numbers of social enterprise in, in Thailand that focus more on the... I think just a brief mention that uh, I think the government approach is that they are very... They believe social enterprise is an uh, effective tool to solve inequality problem in Thailand because we are one of the most unequal countries you know, in Southeast Asia. You can see where that leads up to. You know, our, I think um, the first quartile, the first quartile of the population control 70% of national assets, and you know the last two quart uh, quartiles uh, control like 4%. So that's why all the rate share and the whole thing happens. You know, um, just can you go back a little bit. Uh, so basically, you can see it's the mostly cooperative community organizations. And so, so the policy is more into like rural development and kind of thing, right? But there are also different kind of social enterprises that are it found, founded by institute or non-profit or foundations, you know, like uh, Dalit Home and so on and so forth. And also there are a few social enterprises that are founded out of corporations, out of listed companies. But they are dominated in terms of size by grassroots organizations, large quantity, but very fragmented and per venture is normally very small. Okay? Um, and just we're going very quickly uh, to just example of some of the sectors that they are operating. So, you know, things like uh, uh, alternative energy or re renewable energy at a community level. You know, so there are different kind of things like um, existing condition is that we have around 3.1% of energy production coming out of renewable source. In Thailand, the government set the goals of uh, around 8% by 2011, which is huge, and they are putting a lot of support back up in terms of putting a lot into adders. So a lot of people working on kind of uh, community-based uh, renewable energy solutions like uh, uh, biomass plants using gasification so that it, uh, it's clean kind of thing. Um, you know, and there are companies like that, like Supreme Renewable Energy, you know. So also fast trade, you know, there are some a bit of here that especially fat rate on the agricultural products. You know, in, in Thailand we we export a lot of agricultural products and we are like rice and so on, you know, we are on the top chart, but if you look at the premium market, um, or fat market, like fat rate, organic products, you know, we never are up on the chart. So we always say we are a kitchen of the world, but I think we are like dirty and not very bad addition of the world, but that's a huge market. Uh, you know. Sustainable tourism, sustainable agriculture, also an uh, example. Low income market, uh, um, also you know, possible. There are a lot of people working on that, um, and education, but most of these things are very small in size, but they are huge in quantities. Okay. Um, so, uh, quick thing on policy and intermediaries uh, in terms of contextual information. Um, right now, there is actually a process to come up with. They already have a. Sorry. Uh, so, so now they have a national social enterprise committee, you know, focusing on reducing inequality with Thailand social enterprise office as a secretary. Um, and they have their master plan and policies being endorsed by the cabinet, um, especially tax related and border investment kind of policies. Um, that they are trying to stimulate uh, private sector investment. Um, and then, but there are very few organizations in Thailand who are actually working on the capacity building of all these uh, potential social enterprises. Okay. Um, so this is the last slide. So we, we are helping uh, with the GIS and ADB looking to do a short survey a little bit in, into, a, into a different organizations in, in Thailand, the social enterprise that might want to speak, uh, kind of social capital um, uh, market, right? And it's out of around 100 uh, respondents, you know, I think most of them say they need capital, but most of them are not uh, 
feeling that they are ready for investment yet for very different reasons. And probably maybe because they are still early stage or they are like a kind of a middle level thing and they never have experience with this. And also just a reminder, I think the time even in a public, uh, sorry, private sector, the financial literacy in terms of financing is also very limited among managers. Um, and this last thing is quite, the, maybe the last part is quite interesting that if there are existing funds in terms of where their money comes from, their capital, is that still actually from self uh, or in-house or their family's financing, which is probably most of the companies in Thailand are like that, and a little bit from the bank loans, some from the grants, uh, very little from venture capital. So I think that's kind of give you an overall con context of how, how the market is, but also just to be very optimistic that I think you know, there are huge growth engines in Thailand that's always going to be there, you know, like, uh, susta like sustainable agriculture, sustainable tourism, and all these kind of things. Uh, so I think there's a huge market there. And because of huge inequality in Thailand, I think uh, one of the pyramid type products and services will be quite important. Thank you, Sunil. That's a very good overview of uh, the Thai social enterprise scene. Um, so now we'll have uh, Kun Sukit to talk a little bit about the two entities that he represents and the work that they're doing. Okay, thank you very much uh, that you invited me to talking about social enterprise and corporate social responsibility. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm very glad to sit around with people who want to change the world. <coughs> Back 20 years, when I began doing this kind of thing, I'm so lonely in the world. <laughs> Try to change it, but not so much people come with me now. More and more young generation, young people become a social entrepreneur and try to change the world. And like you said, they begin with NGO. Now, corporate sector has more role to play with on social enterprise and this kind of new thing to change the world. Forget your some example. This is just a small example. I cannot say it all, but this is some kind of example that business corporation can do to change the world, to be a social entrepreneur. Next, please. And you said minor, what is that? So we are food, hospitality, and service. We have 25,000 service professionals in 30 hotels. Thousand of restaurants, two hundred outlet. So this is a kind of service that you might do some of it, right? And then what we call minor because our employee, our people are very young. Next please. And this is the problem of young people, especially in Thailand. They have problem with sex, violence, game, drug, because they don't know how to make money, how to work, how to be a good people. So the first thing of role business, as business, you don't just make profit, but you have to change the world. So next please. So what we, we do, 25 years ago, we begin the campaign of part-time employee. So we've been in that youth on the last slide to work with us. So we solve our problem because in our hotel, in our restaurant, we have a long hour service which we cannot serve our customer well. And then, if we cannot serve our customer well, our business is not good. And if we use the employee to do long working hours, it's not good for employee also. So this is the win-win situation that we bring in the student from the university to work with us past part time so they can earn some money. We can do, do some self-help economy, and then we can solve some problem. We don't use them as employee, but we teach them life value, lifestyle, life skill. A lot of things behind the restaurant you will not see, but we look like their father, mother, or, or brother. Working with them, we ask them and teach them how to save money, how to prevent HIV AIDS. We train them how to be a good, you know, citizen, this kind of thing. This is just some sample that business can be a social entrepreneur by itself. This is one thing. Next, please. Second, in most of the company, we have foundation. So 
in, in Minor, we have three foundations with one as a social enterprise. First is Roy E. Foundation, named after the father of the president, Bill Haneke. We give a lot of scholarship, and we work with the school. We do a kind of education improvement in, in several minority areas. So this kind of thing is social entrepreneur also. Next, please. We have a elephant foundation. It's begin with our manager thing. Why elephant is in Bangkok? It's not a place where they live. So we begin bringing the elephant in Bangkok to our hotel, Anantala and Four Seasons in Chiang Rai. So we begin with one elephant. Now we have 30 something elephant in the camp. So we bring in the elephant, elephant living with our guests. Our guests is very exciting to stay in our tent camp like Hassan, playing in with the elephant. And then our hotel done like the really the choice of the good hotel because we can live it up in harmony with the elephant. Every year we have an elephant polo. You don't have to go to Nepal. You can be in Chiang Rai, you have elephant polo. Elephant polo bring tourists in. Not only our business get income, but the whole community get income. The elephant not only dirty something elephant of our foundation get income. All the elephants all over have come to this place. We feed them, we have hospital, do health check for elephant. We do a lot of things. They have an income within two weeks more than a year they got. And then we begin something like elephant teaching autistic children. So with innovation and thing and partnership with other, the foundation working with corporation can do more things. Next please. In the southern part of Thailand, in, in uh, Mai Khao, near the airport, we have a hotel, Anantara and, and Marriott. At that time, it's not too far away. When you have the new uh, site uh, building, and then if the total go away, all the ecology is gone. And we don't know why, so we work with scientists to find why the turtle don't go to lay egg on the beach. We found out that if you have a light, and then the turtle don't come to lay egg. So we begin working with the community to give the light the season. And then after several years, the turtle don't come. Now they begin to come and lay egg. But they still have a thief to store the egg to, to sell in the market. So we work with the community to protect, we do nursery, we do a lot of things. And we bring in our guests to do a reef cleaning, to be a beach cleaning, and we teach the community around the children to take care of their own environment. Several years that we did a kind of this thing, now the turtle come back, they go to this ocean for two years. We don't know where they go, and they come back like a mature turtle lady, and this ecosystem get connected. This kind of thing that business can do. We raise funds, we do a kind of a check out for charity, some hotel, you got one dollar for one stay, to turtle foundation, one dollar to, to uh, uh, elephant foundation. This kind of thing that business can do. In some hotel, we can ask them that you stay in a hotel. You have a uh, carbon footprint now, $10. So we can ask you to donate $10 to our hotel and some of our hotel get together to plant the tree in, in some place. For example, this is the kind of thing that business can do. Next, please. Third, in our business, we can support social enterprise. For example, if you go to our sister outlet, now we work with the Royal Project. So instead of granting them to do things, we buy things. We buy the organic food, vegetable from Royal Project. Not only buying, we're working with the Royal Project to improve the quality of life of farmers. We use our professional to work with the non-profit because non-profit somehow they don't have a ability to manage or ability to do a marketing. So we help them. They, they don't have to just sell to us. They can sell to others. That's why we begin to do a campaign. Not only the Royal Project, now we work with the uh, Chain fusion to find more social enterprise that we can support. So these three things: first, you can be social enterprise in yourself. Second, you can have foundation that working with your company as social enterprise. Third, you can support social enterprise. This is the new role of 
business. And not only this is some sample from 100 company, 100 brand we have. If we show you 100 brand activity, it will be more. And this time, next please. In stock market of Thailand, we get together and create a CSR hub. We have a 500 biggest company in Thailand get together to do full thing. And then, as I show you, this is one project from one company. We have 500 big company, and you see how can we make change from business sector. But now we are studying why everyone growing the forest, but the forest is gone. Why everyone working about children education and quality of children education is low. So we have to we have to do some mistake. So we begin some research. How can we get together to change the world? And I hope. You see, our generation is very old and very, you see, analog people. A new generation is multitasking, digital thing, and we have to work together to change the world. And I said to uh, Turin that the purpose of social enterprise, some of we hope to change the world. So this is a role that I think the business people can do something. First, thank you very much to uh, ADB and to Impact Investment Exchange to give us the opportunity to support uh, this, uh, this great event today. And good luck to all the participants in the Global Social Venture Competition. Uh, I hope you get some great winners uh, later on, and, and it's great that you're all here today. I'm sorry, I don't have a presentation for you, no, no fancy slides, but I'll just talk to you a little bit about uh, who we are at the IJO and what we do in this space. Um, I'm the director for CSR uh, and regulatory affairs for the Asia Asia Pacific, uh, based in Singapore, which is where we have our hub office. Um, and as such, today I'm sort of wearing two hats. I'm wearing my regional hat for the Asia Asia Pacific, but I'm also representing our local colleagues uh, from the Asia Moet Hennessy, Thailand, which is our local company here, uh, operating out of Bangkok. And I guess most of you won't know about what we do. Uh, Diageo is actually the world's largest premium drinks company, beverage alcohol company. So we have products like Guinness beer, um, scotch, spirits of all kinds, wines, a huge range of products that we, uh, that we market and sell around the world. And um, for many of you, perhaps alcohol isn't something you would immediately correlate with uh, corporate social responsibility and, and doing good deeds, particularly in markets like Thailand, where there's a very big debate. About alcohol. And a lot of my work is spent trying to talk to governments, uh, multilateral organizations about how we can find the win-win solutions uh, that both protect public health interests as well as, um, as commercial interests. And, and I'm convinced, having worked both in the private sector and in the development sector, that there are uh, areas to be tapped um, in, in that sense. So what do we do in, in CSR? Well, we're, we're very proud of the fact that uh, for the last uh, over two years now, we've been working in increasingly in the social enterprise sphere. And let me just talk perhaps on the global stage about how we're involved. Uh, we have a, a, a fund called the, uh, the Arthur Guinness Fund, which was um, sort of set up in the spirit of Arthur Guinness, who set up the Guinness brand in Ireland 250 years ago. And he and his family, over the next two centuries, became very famous for all the work they did, uh, visionary work, to support the communities in which they sold their beer. So if you travel around Dublin or London, for example, you quite often see buildings with the Arthur Guinness Trusts um, written on them. And these were built to support the communities, um, particularly poor families uh, in the communities where Guinness was doing business. And in the tradition of Arthur Guinness, this fund was established uh, two and a half years ago or so, particularly to work in the whole area of social enterprise support. And um, to date, well, when we announced it in 2009, it was an announcement for a 6 million euro uh, fund to support social enterprise. And uh, to date, we've been doing programs all over the world, for example, in Africa, where we work with um, 
uh, water, cheap water filter producers uh, to create uh, sustainable businesses for them in Nigeria and Ghana, um, and at the same time support social entrepreneurs uh, that can help work with the communities to do behavioral change communication to create the markets there for these filter businesses to, um, to expand. Uh, in the States, we work through the Clinton uh, Global Initiative with Youth Business America to support and, and, and provide microloans to young entrepreneurs. I think we're, we're targeting about 150 entrepreneurs there in the next five years. We do a similar project like that in Ireland with, um, I think it's called uh, Social Enterprise Ireland, one of the biggest social entrepreneur support uh, groups over there. Uh, and in, in this part of the world, uh, in Indonesia, we've worked with the British Council to create um, a, a program where we create awareness of what social enterprise is, uh, what are the opportunities out there for young dynamic change makers to, to embark on this voyage. And through a competitive process, I guess a little similar to the one you have here, to identify uh, the most promising ones who in turn receive seed funding from the NGO as well as training from our, from our colleagues. And uh, this is a program that's been going for about a year and a half now and is already um, pro uh, bearing fruits. The target, I think, is to, is to support 30 established social entrepreneurs who will in turn provide the, the support for about another 150 uh, new, new and up-and-coming uh, uh, first-stage entrepreneurs. We've got projects that we're supporting through that, such as um, uh, arts and crafts and culture, batik restoration programs, reintroducing valuable Indonesian culture to the community, uh, uh, using agricultural waste to produce um, uh, organic uh, fertilizer and other bioethanol fuel, uh, marine conservation programs, gender empowerment through farming programs. So a lot of very interesting things, as you would imagine, coming through these competitive processes because uh, people out there have some really good ideas. So that's sort of what we do through the Arthur Guinness Fund. Now I'm that sort of controlled, although I'm sort of an overseer of their program in Indonesia, that is controlled out of Ireland. But I sit here uh, running the Asia Pacific business, CSR side of the business, and I have uh, increasingly demanding and challenging requests from my bosses about creating really impactful CSR programs in the region. And uh, Jureen knows the story because I've told it before. I, we sponsored a, a social enterprise support uh, forum in Singapore called QI or CHI uh, last, uh, last October, I think it was, and I talked about this then. But the challenges we face here are that, you know, I cover a region from India to Australasia, encompassing also in the middle of Southeast Asia, and North Asia, China, and Japan. It's a very huge uh, uh, landmass with a, a broad diversity of economic and, uh, uh, and social and cultural uh, differences. So how do, this, how do I identify a program that would cover all of these? It could be a reasonable template uh, to cover all of these. And that has been a big challenge for me uh, at the edge of working in CSR. But really through this whole thing we're talking about today, social enterprise, I think that has given me the appropriate theme around which to build variations in the different markets, in the markets in which we operate. Because, as you all know, there's, we all have problems defining sometimes exactly what social enterprise is. What is a social entrepreneur? When I talked about this to my colleagues at the Agile, when I first ran it past them, they said, why would we give money to a company? You know, they, they just didn't get it. They're beginning to get it now. But it takes a lot of time, both internally as well as externally. Uh, but I think because of the flexibility this whole field provides us, you know, we're not particular about the areas in which we can support, uh, but uh, it gives us that flexibility to build variations in different markets. So, we're, for example, we're looking at scaling up what we do with the British Council in Indonesia, in other countries, for example, like in, um, in Vietnam, China, and Korea. Uh, also, next, next week, actually, we're about to launch, uh, uh, open, celebrate the, uh, the final stage of a water program that we've supported in Vietnam uh, with partners, uh, East Meets West Foundation, who in turn are supported by a Bangkok-based uh, group called Watershed Asia, based out of the University of North Carolina. And 
that's all about water and sanitation support through social enterprise models. So what we've set up in Ning Thuan province in Vietnam is a program where you know, we've set up the water system, we've covered all of that, uh, but the beneficiaries actually have to pay for a little for, for access to that water. And in doing so, that will sustain the operations of this. In, in effect, the, the, the program becoming a utility. And so for us, for me, that qualifies uh, as, as a sort of a social enterprise-based model, uh, which we are also increasingly keen to explore opportunities elsewhere um, throughout the region. Water and sanitation is, is an area of particular interest, of course, because we rely on high-quality water uh, to produce, um, to produce uh, 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 our products. And probably you, you'll ask these in the questions, but I could, couldn't resist just also explaining why this is important. Also, for us internally, I see social enterprise as, as being a great opportunity for our employees to engage in, in this program. And in fact, uh, it was actually through a discussion with uh, one of your colleagues at the ADB, maybe a couple of years ago, based out of Manila, um, where she said, you know, to be honest, uh, we're you know, we're grateful if you go in with your teams to, to plant trees or dig well for a day, but we have plenty of labor who can do that ourselves. That's not what we really need. <clears throat> what we really need are your core competencies, your marketing and sales skills, your supply chain management skills, your accounting, auditing, all the sort of things that are the bread and butter of a multinational corporation. And so I started thinking, you know, how can we really use uh, the expertise that we have within our organization to really support uh, young entrepreneurs in, in a really meaningful and sustainable way, which both makes our people feel valued, makes them feel that they're really doing something of use, and at the same time uh, supports the beneficiaries um, um, uh, who, who are out there. So a lot, of, a lot of great interest for us in this area. We're delighted to be here tonight. And, um, that's brief, a that's brief that's introduction. Great, that, that was fantastic. And actually, uh, um, you know, let's, can we give a hand? Um, and in some ways, you know, I would like to, you know, I uh, said cheated a little bit because I really wanted uh, to have someone in the panel um, who is from the corporate side who would say the things Lynn just said because this is literally music to our ears because, uh, um, you know, we really believe um, at IAX and at Trudeau what we're trying to do is obviously very large scale, but we need incredible partners to do it with us. And CSR, while the beginning of it obviously started off with corporations doing good on the side, you know, um, with philanthropic work, but it can only be effective if it's part of the DNA. So it can actually be in the practice as well. So um, that's very important. And I think with that, I actually would like to ask, I don't want to do, be a long thing, because I would like all of you to a chance to ask questions to our panelists. But I would really like to ask one question to all three of you. Um, is the fact that how do we actually make it a part of the DNA? You know, because again, the whole notion of social enterprise is actually about sustainability, right? We actually have um, an incredible audience here. A lot of them are you know, competing today, who have competed with fantastic ideas, but there's still a disconnect because they obviously have to from an idea, make it into a company, they have to have the funding, someone has to buy their product, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, now, obviously, corporations are now moving more towards helping this sector, um, but how do we really make it really part of it so that you don't have to go and fight in the board meetings, which I'm sure you probably don't have to anymore, but how do you make a part of that? And so if you are sort of in a position, you know, in Thailand, also to see and have conversations with a lot of the corporations, how can we make them you know, into investors, into these companies? You know, these entities need, need investors. How do we make them into investors? How do we make them into actually real partners rather than sort of being a little, uh, uh, you know, playing a more patronizing role of saying, you know what, we'll just sort of give a donation you know, to a charity. How do we make them equal partners as, as investors? So maybe, Sunit, you start off and maybe I would like to get some thoughts from both of you, uh, you know, and I maybe Difficult question. I know, I know. I let you guys talk and now the tough ones come up. Things came up on top of my mind. I think I have two issues. I think, I mean, if you're asking like, 
what do let's say social enterprises have to do to to get the corporation to really work with them as equal? You know, I don't think that's possible. But, um, I think first thing is that uh, as a social enterprise, right? Um, I think you have to output. Basically, it's about performance. So basically, you have to try to find the most innovative way and cheapest way to outperform your competitors, which can be your next door NGO, so <laughs> or, or existing work in the field, and that's why people get into social enterprise because they, are, you know, they want a better performance, they want a bit better innovation, and that's. I think uh, people get into social enterprise have to be very competitive. You know, so so I think number one, especially if you are a startup and you don't have big names, you know, on your advisory board or something, then you have to just outperform everyone, right? How do they get those members? How do they get advisory board members if they want to get them? Okay, um, just, just let me go first to the, <laughs> the question. Yes. Um, so I think uh, the one is outperform whoever is out there. Number two is. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, you find the right match. You know, basically, just don't go to to all to any corporation. So to see whether you know the, the work you are doing and the work that the corporation is doing have a strategic match. And this can be anything from kind of corporate image for some reason, or like you know, like you were talking about the water issues, or even go beyond that kind of thing and get into something that um, you know, like the Uno Center here is trying to promote. Uh, what they call hybrid value chain, you know, trying to work with them to come up with a new product or service for the new market that, you know, they can't do it themselves. Uh, or some new social business like what they are doing with Danone and, and so on. So, so I think that's kind of my two, say, two things. Right? So I'll perform everyone and try to be very strategic. And, and because only when they perceive you as a strategic uh, values or assets, they will always think of you as assets anyway, then they would basically work with you in a more equal or more interesting way. How do you get a member of the board? Uh, you... Send a note to you. Yeah, I mean, it depends on how old are you. Normally, if you are not so old and you are young, then you can try, you can, you look okay. Normally, you find the people in the... In the <laughs> no, 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 not, not like that. I mean... <laughs> I, I meant, uh, you know, like, slightly successful people that first, you, like, normally you, you already have someone in mind, right, that are successful in that particular industry that can help you, right? And then normally if you are young enough and you have a good idea, if, normally, you know, if you, those people would like to talk to you them, and your job is to make sure that they see themselves in you, then suddenly, you know, they will come on your board. That's kind of my trick anyway. <laughs> The second thing is, again, I think if you actually test your idea on the market very quickly in terms of prototyping the service, you know, get things done a little bit and you show some early results, I think that's where your board member would get very excited and, and, and join you. Right. So, did you want to add to that? Uh, maybe let's get back to the question, right? The good DNA, bad people. I always believe that to change the world, it has to come from people, not other people force you to do, but begin from you inside. The problem is, how many people have that kind of passion? At Minor, we have, a, as a business people, most, most business think just only profit. But nowadays, we think of triple bottom line, people, planet, and profit. In minor, we have slogan in our CSR philanthropy, my people, my planet, and minor have to work together. And then, with three circles that you always see, the difference of minor from other is we have the center of another P, passion. It's written down in the CSR book called Why Ocean Strategy. It's a kind of CSR company and social entrepreneur in a book written by Thai uh, authors. You can find the market. And you see, now people in, in business get more passion and we don't sit in a table waiting for something. We go out and seeking for good project, good program, and good social entrepreneur to work with. The problem is when they go out from the office and see social entrepreneur is unqualified. Most of them are unqualified, to tell you the truth. Most of them, most of them that I, I, I saw. You haven't met the right ones. Maybe. So
So what we begin to do? We begin to educate them, working with them equal, you know, as equal. We don't do like a donor recipient. We working hand in hand, trying to help them develop their capacity to do a kind of thing. To get out of poverty, they have to do business. Do they have to know and understand how to do business? Most of them don't know. Don't know. That's why this is the role of business people get out, working with them. Why working with them? We learn a lot of things that we we missing. That's why nowadays people in business sector don't sit in the office anymore. We are play more active role to go out, and this is a huge opportunity for social enterprise to find the right one. And we try to find the right one also. Maybe I'm unlucky. I find the wrong one. We begin project and fail. We begin project and fail. And then I think this is a good time, and maybe it can help set up a kind of platform to bridge the right one. And it's not easy because we. In business sector, in civil society, in government, we use different vocabulary in the same thing, and they are reluctant and they are not trust each other. That's why you know, before you were going to business, maybe you be, used to be an NGO or other. I used to be an NGO. I used to be a government advisor. Now I'm business, so that's why I can speak three language in Thai. But the different language, the government language, the civil society language, the business language. So communication is the best thing to develop among the group. And get back if you have triple bottom line with passion, you will begin the sustainable thing. And the third sustainable thing begin from human. It's not begin from rule, regulation, or somebody force you to do. How can we create more and more new generation too? That's why, at the moment, CSR club at the stock market of Thailand, we get together to do CSR at the corporate level. Now we proactive go out to the university. We try to promote a kind of new term. Some of you know, USR, University Social Responsibility. Some of them has this kind of, you know, thing to compete. There are several things like student in free enterprise competition. There are more things about copy service and do good things. So we try to force professor in university to change because if do not change and you don't lead by example, student will not change. That's why now business people are more active role in this kind of thing. Right, right. You're absolutely right. The role of that you're playing as an entrepreneur, I think that's that's very crucial. Can I answer that? Um, <coughs> both of you. Great points there. I mean, the, just the simple point about the language and the different vernacular that's out there, the different terms that are being used to express the same meaning, make this whole sector very confusing. And if there would be a way of, <clears throat> through this, through the group you have today and tomorrow, of, of just even coming to an agreement of what common terms you might use going forward in your network, I think that would be. It sounds very small, but it would be actually quite powerful and, uh, and helpful. Um, other things that just sprung to mind were, you know, I know this from speaking to my internal stakeholders and trying to get my bosses and people who work on the commercial side to to understand why it is so important that we're involved in, in this sector and why it makes a big difference to our CSR program. You, you need to develop the skills to communicate what you want to do. Of course it's going to be an enterprise with a social uh, outcome channeling whatever it is back into supporting an environmental or social cause, but you need to be able to express those in commercial terms, in terms that business people will prick up their ears and listen to. Because if all they see is all the language you usually or you've traditionally seen coming out of the civil society sector, I know it's changing, but if that's all you see for the time being, then they sort of switch off and think that's just you know people wearing comfortable sandals sort of thing. Um, or, you know, this isn't really something that means anything to us. So get used to thinking, trying to think how uh, a donor or a funder from a, a private sector company or corporation would be thinking when looking at your applications and, and you know, what they would want to see out of that because that will make a huge uh, impact. And, 
fact, one of the things I was, you know, I was mentioning earlier on about engaging our employees, I mean, that's, that's the whole point of this, is to provide um, entrepreneurs at perhaps the lower level of their development stage with the skills with which they can go and speak to the likes of Doreen, we can go up the scale <coughs> towards you know, raising funds on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an SC a stock exchange, for example, or speaking to venture capitalists, that sort of thing. So that, that's all part and parcel of what's in our mind about how we can support this. Of course, that you, need to do, you need to ensure, and that's the work perhaps of Consulate and Consulate working with the, the government, we need to ensure that there is an increasing, uh, increasingly supportive uh, public sector that uh, provides, uh, that understands the sector, that's not nervous about it as an alternative way, um, and that will begin to make policy changes to support it. And that, of course, is another great indicator of, of, of the impact of the, of the work we do, both at high levels and at low levels. So those are just some, some observations I have. Um, it's very interesting. I think the one theme that kept on coming up, and I think it also shows with all of your backgrounds, fact that you very um, effectively have straddled in your, even your own careers, you know, the public sector and the private sector and the civil society. And it seems like with the whole promotion of social enterprises, the entrepreneurs have to very effectively do that as well. Um, and it will be obviously easier and easier as we move forward. I'm going to open this up to the audience now. And this is a very rare opportunity where you actually have people who speak your language. So. This is actually a fantastic opportunity. So, you know, I will open it up. Do you have any questions, issues? You know, ask them for support. You know, so what, whatever you want to do for the next few minutes, this is your chance. I didn't bring my checkbook. No, no, but it's all right. They, they are, you know, they'll, they'll remember it. I see, Riyadh, you have a very big smile on your face. I'm assuming you have some. That I have all of this. Somebody else can start. I think Unicenter can maybe the, the initiator given the work you're doing on the social business side. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to take up this, uh, this theme of languages. And, and it seems to me that uh, when, when I see uh, in, in Thailand, the interesting thing is, I'm not loud enough. Uh, in Thailand, the interesting thing is that I meet people in the corporate sector who are trying to do uh, go beyond merit making and charitable activities to do something. Uh, but they don't quite know what to do. And then I meet NGOs who have these brilliant ideas, and they don't have the money. And so it seems to me that if I could sort of get the two of them together in some way or the other, that'd be a fantastic sort of uh, win-win situation. But the problem is one of attitude on both sides. The, uh, the NGOs think the corporate sector is evil personified, and the corporate sector thinks NGOs are inefficiency personified. So, uh, so, so there's expectations on both sides that have to be bridged, and I think you all are talking about and both sides have to sort of give up certain certain things. For example, the corporate sector has to give up the idea of, I think there's a time difference, that if you're going to go into a social enterprise, and it's not easy, I think it's a very difficult sector, you have to allow for a lot of time, because things are not going to change overnight. Whereas businesses look at a much shorter time horizon than what I would think of as a social enterprise. So this time thing is very important, I think. NGOs think in a much longer time, perhaps too long, infinite. Whereas corporate sector is thinking in terms of one month. So, so I think this is a real issue. I mean, I'd like you all to say something about that. Um, shall we take one more question and then I've been told we are running out of time. So, yes. Um, so my question is that, is there a role for intermediaries to help bridge this gap? For example, like, you know, Shilpa does a little bit with the hybrid value chain. Is there a need? So I'll just jump in very quickly. Um, I forgot to mention actually one of the most important parts of our uh, social enterprise program through the Guinness Fund is working with Ashoka. We signed a, a three-year, three million euro deal well, agreement with Ashoka to for Ashoka to elect 30 Ashoka fellows over a three-year period uh, globally. Um, so I think we're certainly learning and, and realizing that you have to take a long term perspective on this. I have to do a lot of work internally telling my people, you, know, you can't expect results tomorrow, next month, as you mentioned. This is a long-term thing. There will be failures too, I'm sure. Um, but we're, you know, we're in it for, for strategic purposes. Um, 
I don't need to explain why CSR is important for a corporation. I think everyone understands that. But we, we see this as, um, you know, we definitely want to be seen as leaders in innovation in the CSR field. And, and in order to be seen as a leader in innovation, you have to be patient, um, particularly in areas like Asia Pacific, where this whole field is still very embryonic. Um, but you know, we're trying to get in there early. Yes, I think this is very important. Uh, the problem is three people speak different language. And like you say, you cannot put NGO and corporate in the same room without repairing. So they are not trust each other. My work all my life is the bridge among three sectors. So you have to warm up a little bit from NGO. NGO thing I'm a devil. The business taking money. So I try to educate them, warm them up, let them know the business perspective and what they intend to do. Take some time. And you have to work with them for quite some time. In business, they think I'm a bad NGO. In, in the company, want to take money from that, the profit. So I have to work with financial people, work with a lot of executive for fun, quite some time to get them understand this is a real life of people in the village and then prepare exchange learning it takes some time and then go to talk with the government policy and government said ah you need a kind of thing i just need a vote i don't need a kind of support so you have to work with different the problem is how many people have the skill are there any like you said platform or organization that can help bridging because Sometimes you don't know, like, I don't know who I am. Some of my colleagues who do the same thing said, we have a, what, what do you call, split personality. It's a kind of like a madman. You know, don't know who they are. You talk to community one thing, you call, talk to the government something, talk to corporate something. But the thing is, you said one thing in different language, get them closer together. I think if we do a kind of social enterprise thing or CSR or social development, we have to have some school or some some course that help teach the kind of ability. If not, they cannot link together. But I think nowadays it's different. Young generation, they talk through social media. They link. I begin to see the the young people from rich family have a social media with pleasure, have a social media of the government. So it's a kind of change in, in other sense, but we have to train and we need a kind of academic institute to support. And most of all, we have to begin at the early stage that the world is all people's responsibility, not business, not NGO, not government, but all people, and we have to train young generation at very early stage. Right. Now that, those, are, those are very wise words. And I think um, going back to the question of the intermediaries, I think there's definitely a role to play. And, um, and here is where um, the Change Fusion, Oshoka, you know, Shujo, I mean, we all play a big role in getting the enterprises ready and absolutely you know, making the, the connection. Because capacity building um, is a word that you, you know, concept that you keep on hearing. Um, now the last thing, very last thing, and this is something I will, will wear the hat of uh, IX and Shujo because we do this, uh, we have done this very effectively for our Bangladesh conference and it, it worked very well. And uh, I already um, told my panelists that I'm going to do this, which is um, really say one thing that their organizations will do, and if anyone in the audience wants to jump in to, to uh, share their thoughts, to actually turn the ideas that are coming up into action. And obviously, and these gentlemen in the panel, they're already doing a lot. Uh, but what we'd like to do is, from this gathering that we have, and obviously everything is being taped, so you're on tape, um, we would like to be the messengers in taking this to the different countries. So in Bangladesh, when we talked about the ideas to action, there's a group of corporate sector members who came together, and they actually committed to doing um, work on the low-income housing side. They actually talked about putting a fund together to help the social enterprises. So it was very interesting ideas that came on. Um, 
again, not to put them on the spot, because they're already on, you know, in the spotlight right here, um, I would like to sort of turn to my panelists and uh, request them one thing, either they may be already doing it, they want to showcase it for this group of people, uh, that we can actually hold you to when we come back again um, and do more work in Thailand and beyond. So, who wants to be the brave one? You did say long term, so when we come long back term. again it in like 10 long years term as well. <laughs> Yes, it can be long term, but we have a long memory as well, so we will remember. Um, who wants to start? Um, Sunit, do you, want to, do you want to say something that Change Fusion will continue to do or will do that we can sort of say that is related to this, yeah. the words that were shared today? Yeah, definitely. If we are surviving or we are not going bankrupt, we definitely will do this until the day we die. But um, but we, I think we are very committed in terms of intermediaries. I think at a very early stage of some industry, I think it's all social enterprising, it's a new industry or new niche, you know, you need a lot of intermediaries in the process. And maybe just to a little bit in, into perspective, like, I know, like, for example, very practical thing, like, you know, organic producers and um, people who are into retail, normally they can't talk to each other because, they, you know, we know that there's some market, but the organic people can't produce accordingly to the standard of the producer and vice versa, I mean, of the retailer. In, in Chiang Mai, you know, in the north of Thailand, there's a chain called Rim Ping. It's a very, very good uh, retail chain in, in Chiang Mai. They are working with uh, agriculture, organic agricultural groups that have a few intermediaries that to actually, you know, work together with the corporations to, to, to bring in um, organic produce into the retail chain and and they accept things like you know it's not going to be of you know excellent quality all the time and they factor seasonal thing into the process and this allow Rimpin to launch the new um, new supermarket in Chiang Mai uh, like the villa supermarket here that is branded as organic uh, store which is impossible to do you know if I mean I, talking to some big retailing before and you know it. In, in their connection, what they have in hand, what is the capacity, what is the quality, so I can tell bridging in some of our outlet, what kind of thing that we easily begin to support. That is one thing. Second, we ask Chain Fusion as an active volunteer to get to the, the government, T, what, what is that, TL, T, TSO, something, we have to push them to more active, and we volunteer to be an engine, one of the partners. So we don't let the government the organization sit down and slowly do things slowly. We will force them to do, and we are the engine to do that with passion, and we have power to support. But they have to provide some some platform. We cannot, you know, passion, passion, and. Government don't do something, NGO don't move. But we will be, we play active role, as I, I told you. Now business sector has more active role in that. And we ask Chain Fusion to make appointment. Maybe tomorrow if they can go. Or even some, maybe tonight if they are available, we can go. In business world, we cannot wait. And you said, well, next week, next month. Why not today? After that, we go together, the government do something. I think, I think that's a great idea to, have, to be able to play a role in the public policy side, but I think you can probably, uh, you know, change vision to play a role, but obviously, you know, you're in the process already. Um, and I think matching up the social enterprise work that they're doing um, with what you're doing, and frankly, that's what we want to talk to you about also, the work we're doing um, for Shujo, and see what role you can play. So that's great. Then? Uh, yeah, by the end of uh, this year, I guess, um, we would like to be seeing Diageo that is as, as a, the leading innovator, innovate, innov, innovating company in this field through the work that I've been discussing today, through greater engagement for our employees in meaningful ways to support really dynamic change makers here in Thailand as well as uh, throughout the rest of the Asia Pacific region. But I'm particularly keen on Thailand because you know, I see there's a lot of potential here, there's a lot of ideas, there's also a lot of issues. Um, and while we're talking about government, I also would like to request Kun Sunit to help us 
Well done, network uh, with, with the, the, the Office of the, the, the Government Committee on Social Enterprise, because I think greater public private sector engagement in this is really important. So we would love to be part of that. So. Great. So, Sunit, you have a lot of people with you. So this is fantastic. I know we just created more work for you. Uh, but I want you to give a big hand to our panelists. And um, I believe we're moving on to now the awards ceremony. And then again, please do stay on because um, you know we do have the, the drinks. But before that, I would request our uh, managing director from Impact Investment Exchange to give a token of appreciation from IAX and Shudok to our panelists. <coughs>